Gary Littman, I start with you and this news that Cipollone and Philbin may go farther than they did with what we saw as a public in the January 6th select committee's questioning of them. Yeah, farther really all the way to the absolute sort of holy grail. This, you know, Cipollone and Philbin repeatedly told Trump what he was planning was unlawful. The obvious question, well, what did he say when you told him that? And the response to date has been, I can't talk because of executive privilege. But that executive privilege claim is dubious, and the holding that Judge Howe already made about vice, the vice president's uh, staff indicates it. Though it might be different for the president, but the argument from the Department of Justice is, first, Biden has waived, and that would normally suffice, but there's one Kavanaugh opinion out there that suggests maybe that's not enough, but two, and this is basically what the, George, what the South Carolina court said about Meadows in Georgia, they need the evidence, and this is what happened in the Richard Nixon case. If you need the evidence, executive privilege yields. So they are really close in a sort of pincer movement on two sides to getting the most important evidence that has been withheld to date, namely just what Trump said when he was told things were unlawful or what he said about Pence, everything he said on January 6th. That would be the most vivid testimony of, of intent to date. So, Mary McCord, I asked members of the select committee if after um, Cipollone's deposition, if there was any single question for which he invoked the Fifth Amendment, his Fifth Amendment uh, protection. They said no. So the only things he didn't answer were the things for which he exerted executive privilege. If Harry's saying they go all the way, that, that sounds like the, the Justice Department will be able to get answers to those two questions we showed. Did Trump do anything to protect the vice president once he knew he was in danger? And did Donald Trump want people to leave the Capitol? Those two things are at the, the, the beating, bleeding heart of the crimes that took place that day. Yeah, and I, you know, I agree with uh, Harry's analysis, basically. You know, the executive privilege, there is uh, some um, case support for a former president being able to still exert, ex assert executive privilege, but it is not... Uh, absolute. It is always a balancing test, and particularly when it's a criminal investigation. Um, as Harry mentioned, the case of United States versus Nixon is clear that when there is a demonstrably critical need for it in that investigation, the executive privilege must, must yield. And so I think what we see, they're seeing here is the Department of Justice saying, we're not going to just take no for an answer uh, the way, frankly, that the House Select Committee sort of was left to in their situation. We're going to go ahead and litigate this. And, and that's what they're doing. They're they're using their ability to go appeal a grand jury matter, you know, to the chief judge of the district court and get a ruling there. And, and even more recent than the Nixon example, Harry, I mean, Don McGahn spent, I think, close to 30 hours answering questions and certainly getting well beyond the bail of attorney client privilege when he did so for Robert Mueller. Is that a more apt comparison to a top White House lawyer testifying against a president? No, because attorney-client privilege doesn't apply when the attorney works for the United States. That really is off the table. Trump has just a, once again tried to proffer it in the Mar-a-Lago case with the special master down there, but it is a stone-cold loser. So really, the, his last offense that I think is really imperiled now before Judge Howell is executive privilege. Um, I want to bring Carol in again. Carol, I want to show some of, again, with less investigative tools at their disposal, this is some of what the select committee got from Mr. Cipollone. I assume, Pat, that you would agree the president is, is uh, obligated to abide by the rulings of the courts. Of course. And I assume you also would agree the president has a particular obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That is one of the president's obligations, correct. My view is that the vice president had, didn't have the legal authority to do anything except what he did. I think I was pretty clear there needed to be an immediate and forceful response statement, public statement, that people need to leave the Capitol now. Did you continue, Mr. Cipollone, throughout the period of time up until 417, continue, you and others, to push for a stronger state? Yes. After that, 
Some people were resigning, obviously, over January 6th. We know who they, they were. Uh, did I consider it? Yes. Did I do it? No. Concerned about is if, if people in the council's office left, who would, who would replace me? So, Carol, at, at right behind and, and really not even veiled at all is this fear of the council's office walking out. You hear it in the text from Sean Hannity to Mark Meadows. If this, then, then that. And the that is that the entire council's office walks out. We know from Donald Trump installing Jeffrey Clark for at least long enough for him to show up as the acting attorney general on White House call logs, which we have seen, that overthrowing the attorneys was central to the coup plot on paper. We know Trump is tied to all of it, the violence. We also know, though, that the coup plot on paper was what Trump was trying to do with Jeffrey Clark. And the entire White House counsel's office walking out was one of the last sort of strained guardrails on our executive branch of the government. How important is the testimony of Pat Cipollone and his deputy, Patrick Philbin? You frame that just right, and it makes me think so much about some of the interviews that we did in 2020, in which we learned that, uh, forgive me, in t early 2021, where we learned that, you know, Mitch McConnell was worried that Pat Cipollone was going to resign, and then where would they be without at least, as you say, that strained guardrail? Where, where would the country be headed? Even after uh, the insurrection was not successful in, you know, changing the results of a presidential election, still McConnell himself was calling uh, to worry about this fact. Um, I agree that that moment is one of the most important, both before the insurrection and after it, whether or not the, the White House counsel's office walked out en masse um, was a huge deal. Um, the other thing I think that's really important about Pat Cipollone's testimony is, and you notice it in the replay of those tapes, he does everything to avoid saying what he told the president and what the president told him. That is, that's a hard line that Pat Cipollone has walked in his view of the privilege that he owes the office and owes the president. But just imagine what he has said to the president. We already know what he said to Mark Meadows, which is, this is crazy, Mark. The president has to do something right away. He has to go out and tell people to leave the Capitol before someone is killed, or else those deaths will be on your head, your mark head, and and by by association they'll be on the president's head. So, you can imagine that his testimony goes right to the heart of Donald Trump's state of mind, Donald Trump's wishes, even in the face of a, a good lawyer telling him that what he was proposing was crazy and or illegal. And it goes to the state of mind of the president when he rejects that advice.